Hi, and welcome to the Church Renewal Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Edwards, and this week we're featuring a renewal story. Renewal stories are where we go to talk to pastors and ministry leaders on the front lines of church revitalization and renewal to hear the ways that God is growing and changing and and inspiring his church. And today we're featuring a story uh, from a Flourish friend um, named Eric McDaniel. Eric is the pastor of Grace Presbyterian Church in Jasper, Tennessee, a little rural town of 3,300 people in East Tennessee. And we're, we're going to explore the ways that Jesus is renewing that congregation, which was a very intentional uh, revitalization work. Would you like to learn more about church renewal and revitalization? Flourish is producing podcast episodes, our blog uh, at flourishcoaching.org, online workshops and in-person conferences for pastors and church leaders uh, as a way to further this conversation about church renewal and revitalization. So please reach out to us. You can find us online at flourishcoaching.org and you can get me. I'm Alan, A-L-L-A-N at flourishcoaching.org by email. All right, let's dig into the ways that Jesus is renewing his church. Hey, Eric, welcome to the Church Renewal Podcast. How you doing, brother? Living the dream, baby. <laughs> and uh, tell our audience, where are you joining us from? I'm in Jasper, Tennessee. Jasper, Tennessee. Is that that's East Tennessee or West Tennessee? It's East Tennessee, about 25 miles west of Chattanooga, Tennessee. OK, I love East Tennessee, man. It is. It's not all Dollywood. I mean, Dollywood's there, but there's things other than Dollywood in East Tennessee, right? Yes, we are in the beautiful Squatchy Valley. There's mountains on the other, on each side of us. Beautiful Lake Nickajack. It is utterly beautiful, stunning. <laughs> well, for our listeners, Eric is a pastor in the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, he's currently pastoring what what, what is an intentional uh, revitalization and renewal work. And today we have Eric on the show because we love to tell the stories and and tell the stories of the way God is renewing local churches. And so. Um, to that end, we've asked Eric to just come and talk about how he came to this call as a renewal pastor, a revitalization pastor at a local church, and some of the things he's learning about it. Um, and so, Eric, I, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just kind of tell us, how did you end up in a place where you are intentionally pastoring a revitalization church? You knew you were coming to do revitalization work. They knew you were coming to do it. How did that happen? Oh, man, thank you for asking and inviting me into this space. Uh, I love to tell the story. I'll say this. My mom has always said about my ministry season of life, being in ministry. She said she reminds me of the psalmist who wrote, my lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. And when I look at the area God has called me to minister in all my life, I can see those boundary lines, the things that God has set up, to, the parameters that have helped make me be able to minister the way I do and where I do. So the first thing I would say is how I got to Jasper starts with uh, the first boundary line, which was my home church in Anniston, Alabama, Faith Presbyterian Church. I teethed in ministry on them. They raised me. I was there for about 19 years, first as a youth pastor. And then they sent me to seminary. They hired me back as an assistant pastor. They have, they've loved me and my family well, mm. but they, they nurtured me to be able to leave them and go minister at another church somewhere, somehow. Now, it was a smaller town, uh, although significantly bigger than Jasper, Tennessee, but it's still a small, fairly rural town. And so to go to Jasper, which is a rural town, as we said, in East Tennessee, it was not a big jump. And I also had the opportunity in Anniston to teach at the day school that they had. And it was there that I was introduced to speaking about God and Jesus Christ to small groups of people. I had a class of nine kids and I learned to not be afraid of preaching mm -hmm. to small groups of people. Mm -hmm. So when I came to Jasper in a renewal situation, revitalization that didn't have many people in a rural town, it was a good fit for what I'd been raised up in. So that's my first line. The second line that set this border is our the receiving church here at Grace Press. They have been a fantastic group of people. The guy who was before me tilled up amazing fertile ground. There is very little I can do to fail 
in this mm. situation. They have such low expectations <laughs> and, and I'm so thankful <laughs> for that. They encourage me. They are so eager to say, we want the gospel to go forward in this town. Um, and we want to be a part of this. So the, the receiving church was willing to risk on me. A third area that was a, a boundary was my presbytery. Tennessee Valley Presbytery literally put their money where their mouth was. They said, we don't want to only be planting churches. We also want to be renewing those that currently exist. How do we breathe new life into it? Asking the Holy Spirit to allow churches that may be dwindling to come back to life. And so they intentionally were looking to do revitalization in Jasper, Tennessee. So uh, they, they gave money to me and to the church to help sustain me. I have a wife and six kids. Mm. And so it's hard to have a early 40s, big family guy come to a small church that has 11 people in it. But the presbyteries walk beside me. Not only did they give me money, they intentionally, through the Presbytery's m a committee, have been reaching out to me consistently. How are you doing? Phone calls, emails, texts. They've come out and eaten meals with me. They've invited me to Chattanooga. But they also said, we want you to use some of the money we've given you to get good coaching. We don't want you to be out on an island in Marion County all by yourself. And so they introduced me into the coaching arena, which I was able to connect with Flourish. The fourth line that I have have uh, that's been pleasant for us, and we didn't expect this here in Jasper, is the development of a somewhat retirement community on Jasper Mountain. Mm. People from 47 different states, five other countries have come to Jasper Mountain to relocate to spend the last years of their life, their retirement years. And that has brought a fresh group of people into a rural town that wasn't necessarily growing. And some of them have connected with us as a church. And then the last, the last of the borders really is my family, my wife in particular. She is willing to go, she's willing to risk, she's willing to go on adventure. And she packed up everything that was familiar and known, doctors, uh, pharmacists, all kinds of things that were settled for us. She literally uprooted her life and her family and said, I will move with you because we want to be where Jesus has called us. So mm. that's our boundaries that have enabled us to come here and minister. And it has been hard and delightful all at once. So at some point you have this conversation with your wife where you say, hey, I have an idea for what we should do with our big family. We should go to a church with 11 people in rural Tennessee. Eric, how'd that first conversation go? Yeah, so it wasn't exactly quite like <laughs> that. <laughs> um, in all actuality, we have been exploring what's the next step? Is God calling us somewhere? I had been in great conversations with my pastor in Alabama and the session saying, we think God may be calling us elsewhere and they walked with us. They prayed with us. It was, again, quite unusual. Usually those things you want to keep secret so that nobody knows and right. feelings aren't hurt. But they walked with me. They helped me ask good questions of places I might interview. They directed me towards a friend in Birmingham who has done things like this. Um, that being said, Maggie, my wife, has been in these conversations all along. So there wasn't really a first one. And when this opportunity opened up, it was exciting to her because Chattanooga is a bit of a hub for both of our families. Mm -hmm. My family is in Chattanooga. Her family is a little bit north in East Tennessee and a little bit west in Middle Tennessee. So getting closer to Chattanooga was good for our family dynamic. So mm -hmm. it was a bit of an easier sell, if you will. But of course, the Holy Spirit was moving in her. She's an adventurous person with me, and she signed up years ago saying, I'll go with you anywhere. Sure. Now, it's, it's, still, it's still difficult to imagine willingly going to a call where there's, you know, under 20 people in the church. There, there, we, you, know, you know, you're a friend of Flourish. You've, you've worked with some of our team before. We've, we've been at events together. You know that we say all churches need renewal. Some churches are in acute need of revitalization. Um, your situation was a pretty acute situation. 
was there a point where you said to yourself, yeah, I want to take this kind of challenge on? Yes, absolutely. We had to come to that point because the reality was it was a financial situation that would either bring us here or keep us from from coming to Jasper. Um, as I've looked at revitalization, it seems that there can be both body work and soul work of a okay. church. What do you mean by that? Well, there are things that are very unhealthy in churches that you know need to die. There are sacred cows that need to be slaughtered that we don't need a, a part of that. There's their soul revitalization that has to happen. That seemed to have already happened at Grace Pres before I ever got here. The session, who I get to work for and with, were like, we'll, we're ready to do about anything for the gospel to go forward here. Um, I have long hair that I put in a man bun. I preach in a robe. And they're like, if we think you're a hindrance to the gospel, we'll let you know. But they're willing to risk on a Yahoo like me. <laughs> Then there's body work that says it's not necessarily because of grievous sins that we're down to 11 people. It's a small world church. It's a reformed church that is not the teaching of the reformed tradition is, is not taking massive root in the Bible belt necessarily. Mm -hmm. and, and in the community that I'm in, we are the only reformed and Presbyterian church in three counties. Mm. And so people already look at us like we've got five heads whenever we talk about certain things in the reformed tradition. But but the soul of the church seemed to be strong and solid and willing to risk if this is what Jesus wants to have happen for this particular church in this community. The body dynamic was going to be hard. And so when Maggie and I looked at this and as we're praying the body dynamic was not nearly as scary as a soul dynamic. Mm -hmm. And again, I've been working in a school where I was teaching maybe nine kids. So to preach every Sunday, preach my guts out to 11 people. Jesus had been training me for that for about three <laughs> years. So it wasn't that scary. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So I like that distinction, body and soul work. Uh, maybe, maybe um, there's, there's a common, uh, there's a common phrase that you hear around ministry circles, trellis and vine, right? Vine is the life and trellis is the structure, the system. And that you're kind of using soul the way some people use vine and body, the way some people use trellis. You felt like this church had, had good heart, had good, healthy vine needed some, some, some system, some freshness, some energy to help them take some positive steps forward. Absolutely. That is well said. Yes, trellis and vine. That was one of the, the visuals that we used to articulate what we were doing when we were asking people to become supporters, prayer and financial supporters with us. And we talked about trellis and vine work. So did you did you recruit support? Now, this is we think about recruiting support as something that missionaries definitely do. Maybe campus ministers and maybe church planners do. The idea that the pastor of an established local church might get help, prayer support, think like a missionary before going into a local church. That seems foreign to most people. What was that like as you were building your kind of community behind you guys before you went on the field? Oh, such a good question. And it is a paradigm change in so many people's minds to think about an established church needing financial support. Mm -hmm. There's Usually, or what we came up against oftentimes was people, when they heard that a particular church who'd been around for 15 years was in financial trouble, people seemed to lean towards, well, you probably just need to let them die. Sure. Yeah. But when we started to talk about what we thought God might, God might be doing here in Jasper in a rural town and seeing the skill set God had raised up in me. It seemed like we have apple pie. We got Cool Whip. Hmm, what should we do with this? Oh, <laughs> let's put them together. And so my sending church and the sending community in Aniston, they were like, we see these gifts. We think we're for you. And so we had a lot of one-time, first-time, get-on-the-field 
financial support. Mm -hmm. What has become hard is the idea of in a rural town where there's not a lot of growth, also in, with a Reformed tradition, so there's not a, necessarily a lot of people who might be coming to this church, even if we're doing exciting, amazing things. The idea that a revitalization opportunity might need financial and prayer support for seven, 10 indefinite years, mm -hmm. that's very, very foreign to us. But we don't have a problem thinking that way about missionaries, like you said, or campus ministers. Right. And it is definitely a paradigm shift in people's minds to begin to proclaim that. But that has been a tough, difficult road to go down. But I am thankful that God continues to move in people's hearts to say, hey, we'll keep going until you tell us to stop. Yeah. So at Flourish, one of the things we do is we think about three ways of looking at the renewal of churches, uh, or we call them, you know, the three facets. One is like the inner life of the people. One is the situation on the ground. Like, what do we do in this context? And then the third is like the big picture, right? So for the church, that big picture is the great commission of Jesus. Um, so for starting with that kind of facet, that way of thinking, when you think about the great commission of Jesus, the kingdom of God coming to bear in Jasper, Tennessee, it might not look like it does in a, in a growing suburban Florida community where you're going to have a thousand people if you're a pretty successful church and you're going to be financially independent in a, in you know a couple of years. Uh, what what does what does your church catching fire for the mission of Jesus in that place? What does that look like in Jasper and in your context? If I'm understanding the question correctly, I would like to start this way. We try to ask church planting type questions when I first got here. Okay, cool. One of those questions was. If our church disappeared from Jasper, Tennessee, or Marion County, would the community feel a whole? Would it make a difference? Mm. And of course, that was my way to try and paint a bigger picture, a bigger narrative to say, what big things can we do for Jesus here that one day if we did get swept out of this town, it would leave a gaping hole in Marion County. Let's dream big for what we can do for Jesus and his kingdom here in Marion County. The response I got from one of the 11 core members changed everything for me. After I asked that question, would it make a difference? She looked at me and she said, it'd make a difference to me. And this is the way it affected me. She was saying of the 11 of us who come every time, it leaves a very big hole in my life if Grace Prez is not here. And now I began to ask, how many people do we need for this to be a quote unquote um, important, quote unquote, worthwhile church situation? Mm -hmm. And that began to change the way as well. Maybe we're not talking, we, we don't have to be big, we don't have to be massive. We have to minister to the 35 people who have intentionally come to us and say, we think that you worship Jesus well and you spur us on to love him and love our neighbor more. And if it's 35 people, if it's 40 people, then we want to be faithful with them. And it would be a gaping hole in their lives if we were left. Mm. So that helps us in terms of the big picture with Jesus. How are we ministering to even just a small amount of people? How are we painting a big vision for them of what Jesus is doing? The second question that we asked that was kind of church planting to us was starting to turn the, the question on its head. Rather than how do we get more people to come to our church? Mm -hmm. We started to ask the question, how do we get whoever's in our church out into the community to say, we think we exist for you? And how can we start looking for opportunities to serve? And I'll be honest with you, Alan, we're not sure where we've landed on that. Mm -hmm. We don't know all the opportunities. We do know we have been able to help two or three local ministries and very small amounts, but it's a start. And if that continues to grow over the next four, seven, 12, 28 years, we want to walk that path. Yeah. 
And so, so that kind of brings it to your, your local context, right? There's not, and I, there's not like a one size fits all. Here's the five step plan to bring biblical vitality to your church. I mean, there, there are those kind of guides out there and, and each can be helpful in its season, but renewal and revitalization strategically will might look different in Marion County than it does in, I, I'm, I live 35 miles outside the city of Pittsburgh and there's a, you know, there's a couple of church plants in the city of Pittsburgh. They're, their strategy locally is going to be different. So what are you learning as someone who may have some similar makeup, right? Uh, you Nine kids in your class at the school, whatever, uh, rural community, right? Um, what, what are you learning about what it means to do church well, to, to love Jesus well, to participate in the mission of Jesus in that context, in Marion County, in Jasper, what, what are you learning about it, it on the ground? So our top priority, obviously, like everybody else, is we want to, to worship God well. So we put a lot of effort into that. Of course, during this COVID era, that's about all we are able to do together, and, and we want to worship well. That being said, we me and my family and, and our church are in a revitalization opportunity. So we looked at our downtown square. Jasper has 3,300 people in it. It is not a big town. There are four traffic lights in the entire town. Mm -hmm. And the two streets are Main Street and Betsy Pack. Everything mm -hmm. exists off of that grid. The downtown square has seven vacant buildings. There's nothing in them. They're torn down. So we had this great idea. We're going to do great things for Jesus. We're revitalization. Let's say we're for this town. Let's revitalize. Let's move our church gathering place downtown on the square to say we are for this town. We want to make it better. We want to bring vitality back to it. Systematically, one by one, we went down to every vacant building and Jesus closed the door every time. Mm -hmm could not get in. It always fell through. And I was scratching my head saying, this doesn't make sense because I'm reading articles about other small towns where a small business or church moves in and they revitalize. They're part of revitalizing their downtown. I thought we can do that. It will be great. And that is not what God had us do right then. But we went to every single vacant one and, and the door was shut on all of them. So then we said, okay, there's a college campus. It's a community college, 1.7 miles down from our church building. Let's start working with them. Had the opportunity to partner somebody else who is a very brave soul, Scott Wells, who said, hey, I'll join with you guys. Mm -hmm. And we, we part-time have hired him out to be, he's got campus ministry experience. This is an absolute gem that fell in our laps because we can't afford even me. And now we're bringing on a second minister that we can't afford. He has <laughs> to raise money, but he can minister to Chattanooga State, Kimball Campus. How exciting. And then COVID hit and we can't be on campus and there are no oh. students there. And we're like, Lord, we are trying. We are trying so <laughs> hard. What do you want us to do? And there's it keeps coming back. Just be faithful right now to mm. proclaim the word of God and talk to people who I open the door for you to talk to. Yeah. And so we're just trying to walk right there. Right. So I love that. Like for you, the strategy starts with kind of the, the typical church planting playbook. What's the, what are the institutions? Let's get near to them. Let's love them. Let's make an impact. And the Lord has just continually forced you to be adaptable in your strategy, hasn't he? That's exactly right. And what I think we may be finding ourselves doing is, again, who's already doing something and how can we come alongside of them mm -hmm. to do that? So we have uh, an organization called Champion Commons in Marion County, and they are helping those who are recovering from addictions and coming out of trauma. And we find ourselves being able to at least pray for them. We find ourselves in conversations with them. We've helped organize a closed closet for them. We don't have a closed closet. We don't have a place to put it. 
but somebody already does. And what we can do is send people there to organize the closed closet. So uh, we find ourselves, what Jesus may be asking us to do is to walk into doorways that other people, he's already opened for other people. Mm, yeah, that's that's so interesting because I feel like so often when, like someone might say to me, why are you, why are you telling Eric's story? Shouldn't you be trying to tell some story of some like overnight success? I don't think that's what it's about, man. I think church renewal is about a growing curiosity for the place. Uh, an interest in the mission of Jesus in that place and a willingness to, I like the way you put it, to be faithful with the person who's right in front of you. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. And That's I agree. Beautiful. Your assessment is spot on. Renewal takes time. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's close with this. Let's get inside your heart a little bit. Okay. So how long have you been on the field now in this call? Four years. Four years. Um, what, what have you learned about yourself? As a, as a pastor, as a father, as a husband, as a follower of Christ, what are, what are some of the things that you've learned about yourself as you've felt the ebbs and flows, the, the hey, we're going to do this. Okay, the Lord's not letting that happen. What, what are you learning about the inner life of, a, of, a, of a, a leader and a pastor through this experience? Oh, how long is this program? <laughs> <laughs> I will have to say I'm a youngest child uh -huh. and all my life, I've always felt like the youngest child. Even in my ministry in Anniston, Alabama, I was always the number two or three person. What that means is I could be goofy. I could be silly and somebody else takes the rap for it. <laughs> I could think like a, a little brother and being the leader being the solo pastor has forced me um, to say to grow up is, is not the right phrase, but to force me to go, you are the leader. People don't look at you like the little brother. They look at you like their pastor. There are a couple small children in our church who they're going to grow up remembering. Yeah, my pastor had long hair. Sometimes he wearing a ponytail. He was this weird guy. Um, and remember when we watched it on the computer and, and they had those <laughs> banners behind them? It is shocking to me to think that God has put me, me of all people, a goofball like me in a position where people don't look at me like a goofball. People are ready to be angry at me for decisions I make mm. or they're ready to follow me because of decisions I make. And I'm learning that I don't know what it means to be a leader. I, I don't know how to be a leader well, even as a Presbyterian, where as a teaching elder, I'm one of many who rule together. But right. yet I am the one by virtue of my position am somewhat the neck that turns the head of the ruling elders to look in certain directions. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning about leadership. I'm also learning about time management. I don't know because there are no parameters really, except you, you just need to be able to do a worship service on Sunday morning <laughs> and preach a sermon. That's about all the expectations. And so there's this disjointed, am I doing enough? Am I working enough? Is it okay for me to have watched a movie at two o'clock on a Wednesday? Is it okay for me to stop and watch a Liverpool match on Thursday at 10 in the morning? Those types of things. And I'm learning through my coach. Are you keeping the schedule Jesus has asked you to keep and not what some fictional session at a different church context might be required of you? So I'm learning those things. And then as a, a husband and a father, I am learning. Um, man, it's been there have been some hard times as a father, and I am learning that even if I'm doing everything correct, that doesn't mean that God owes me a picture perfect family. And that's been hard for me because oftentimes I have fill in the blank righteousness. I have um, loving my kids righteousness. I have fun loving dad righteousness. I have whatever. And oh, I've, I've done family right. And so it should come out right when you say, OK, yeah, yeah. And and it hasn't necessarily been that way. Um, so, yeah. At this point, I'm rambling. 
No, no, that's that's real though. That's real talk. So if if I was to bring a guy to you and and say, "Hey, this is Joe. He's prayerfully considering a, an intentional revitalization renewal pastorate." Um, would you very quickly talk him out of it <laughs> or or what 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 might you say to my my fictional guy here who's 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 thoughtfully saying, "Yeah, the Lord might be calling me to a renewal work." Yeah, the first thing I would say is I think there are processes set up now within our denomination where you can go and ev be evaluated if revitalization is for you and if you're for revitalization. And I would quickly point them to that because it does take a certain type of person, a certain type of crazy to enter into this. Uh, God has made us all very unique in different ways. And there are some that are just bent towards things like this and not towards managing a massive church somewhere. So I wouldn't try and talk them out of it, and I wouldn't try and talk them into it. I would say, go and be evaluative. Try and listen to their heart and see if this is what they want to do. I am obviously for it. The one thing I would say is you just need to know it is hard, and it's hard on so many levels, and there is suffering that mm. comes from the outside to you, there's suffering that you choose to go towards, and there's suffering that rises up because of wickedness in your own heart. Be ready to address all three. Mm, yeah. Eric, thank you so much for sharing uh, a piece of your story and the, the journey and the work God is doing for you. If folks want to connect with you, learn more about the church you're at, uh, are, is your church online? Is it on Facebook? Where can they, where can they find more about Grace, Prez, and Jasper? Oh, man, thanks for asking. Yeah, absolutely. We have gracejasper.org is our website. Um, again, in our context, Facebook is not a real big thing. So we have a page, but we don't use it all that much. But connecting through our website is probably the best way. Great. Eric, thank you so much for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Alan. Thanks for listening today to the Church Renewal Podcast. It's been an excellent journey into the ways Jesus is renewing a particular church We'd love to hear the stories of how Jesus is renewing your church and ministry. Reach out to us online, facebook.com slash Flourish Coaching and the number one, that's Flourish Coaching One. You can also find us and our blog where we post podcast episodes, resource reviews and recommendations and thoughtful pieces to help encourage you as a ministry leader at flourishcoaching.org. You know, there's only one fully sufficient reason that this day dawned and it is that Jesus is yet gathering a people to himself, and the ordinary way he does that is through the ministry of the local church. So join us next time here on the podcast as we explore the ways that Jesus is renewing his church.